United Nations member states on Tuesday will hold the 76th general debate session. Canadians gave Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party a victory in Monday's parliamentary elections. Tunisian President Kai Zayed vowed on Monday to appoint a Prime Minister, but said emergency measures that he announced in July will remain in place. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada. Now we begin with the news. United Nations member states on Tuesday will hold the 76th general debate session. Under the theme, Building Resilience Through Hope to Recover from COVID-19, Rebuild Sustainability, Response to the Needs of the Planet, Respect the Rights of the People and Revitalize the United Nations, the 76th session of general debate of the organization will address paramount topics that affect the international community, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, vaccination rollout and preparedness ahead of health crisis. Climate change and action to tackle it, it is also expected to be discussed. This year, because of the pandemic, world leaders are invited to send in pre-recorded videos of their speeches, which will be broadcast as live. However, several countries can attend the debate in person with limited delegations. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, will introduce the annual report of the activities of the organization at the opening of the central debate. Human rights groups have slammed the Biden administration for mass deportations of Haitian asylum seekers from the United States after thousands managed to cross into Texas following long and dangerous journeys. Images of U.S. Border Patrol agents in Texas rounding up Haitians on horseback have also sparked outrage. More than 15,000 people, mostly Haitians, have been camped under a bridge in Texas after wading across Rio Grande from Mexico. Over 300 were forcibly deported and arrived in the Haitian capital on Sunday, while another 128 arrived on Monday, including 45 children. U.S. Department of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas said on Monday say that six and a half thousand asylum seekers have been taken into custody in advance of processing and removal from the United States. The vast majority will be expelled under Title 43, a Trump-era health order that cites the coronavirus pandemic as a reason to quickly expel people seeking asylum at the U.S. border. Human rights groups have insisted the order is a violation of the U.S. own migration policies. In the context of the mounting migratory crisis in the U.S. border, Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador reiterated his proposal to the United States to implement social programs in Central America to tackle poverty and unemployment and offer people opportunities to thrive in their home countries. Action must be taken with greater urgency, promptly, and investment made in Central America, especially the programs that are being applied in the southeast of the country in Chiapas, especially the Sowing Life and Youth Building the Future programs, which can be applied immediately in Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador to create expectations, hopes and so that people are not forced to immigrate. That is what we are proposing to President Biden. Referring to the recently held sixth summit of the Community of Latin America and Caribbean States, President of Mexico and summit host Andes Manuel López Obrador described the agreements reached as positive. Well, the outcome of CELAC is very positive. Many presidents, ministers, diplomats from Latin America and the Caribbean participated. There was a good meeting in spite of the differences. It had been a long time since a meeting like this was held because there was a lack of agreement there was confrontation. That was expressed in the CELAC meeting, but it is part of the diversity and diplomatic plurality that exists. I have always maintained that political confrontation is consubstantial with democracy. 
The new cabinet of Argentina was sworn in this Monday, following a reshuffle in the light of the negative primary results of the ruling party. President Alberto Fernandez named Juan Manzur, governor of Tucumán province, his new cabinet chief of staff, as part of the changes announced last week in the aftermath of the elections. Other ministerial changes were the portfolios of security, livestock, agriculture and fishing, foreign affairs, education, science and technology, and also communications. On learning the results of the primaries held last Sunday, President Alberto Fernandez recognized that his government had to change strategy and to ensure it better responded to the demands of Argentine voters in order to reverse the negative results come November when the country will hold legislative elections. Put oil strength into it. The solution to the problem of the Argentines does not lie in dividing us. It lies in being more united than ever to face what is needed. You will not see me trapped in unnecessary disputes. In internal disputes, my only concern, like the only concern of all of us who are part of this government and this space, is that Argentines should be happy again after so much misfortune experienced in the four years that preceded my arrival in government and in the two years of the pandemic. President of Vietnam, Nguyen Suan Phuc, ended his official visit to Cuba on Monday after being awarded the order of Jose Martí, the Cuban president, Miguel Díaz-Canel. The visit saw the signing of several agreements on health, construction, tourism, cybersecurity, and energy. After meeting with Cuban biotechnology experts, the Vietnamese head of state made official the purchase of some 10 million doses of Cuba's Abdallah vaccine against COVID-19. The initiative also includes joint cooperation in the development of the shots. Meanwhile, executives of Cuban hotel groups signed a memorandum of understanding with a Vietnamese firm for the creation of a joint venture for the construction and development of hotel projects. In addition, a power purchase agreement was signed between Cuba's Electric Union and the Thai Bain Green Power Investment Corp for a solar power project in the Morel Special Development Zone. The occasion also saw the symbolic delivery of a donation of 5,000 tons of rice from Vietnam as a sign of solidarity in the face of Cuba's challenges. We'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Be welcome to From the South. Canadians gave Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party a victory in Monday's parliamentary elections. The Liberals won most seats of any party. They led in 156 ridings, the Conservatives in 123, the Quebec-based Bloc Québécois in 29, the leftist New Democratic Party in 28, and the Greens in two. The polls came two years early and were announced just last month as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau make a risky bid to secure a parliamentary majority, having failed to do so in 2019. Prime Minister's attempt to win a majority of seats failed and the result was remarkably similar to the election two years ago, so he still has to rely on help from other parties to pass legislation. I'm personally inter uh, um, interested in the idea of UBI, not because I could personally use it, but because I know too many people uh, who would, who their quality of life would improve if such a thing did exist. And today, I was mostly just concerned with not having conservative success personally, just because I, I know a lot of people who could use a lot of help, yeah. Well, there's so many disasters going on around the world, and I hope they can make changes to the climate change yeah, and improvement. You know. Hello. The very important topic for everybody now is how to handle this situation with the virus, so the economics, the business will continue to, to work and uh, um, I know this is like most important now to keep people working.
Now we address other topics. In Cuba, the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology reported that the domestically developed COVID-19 vaccine Abdallah has shown to be 90% effective in seriously ill patients. The institution reported that such effectiveness was even recorded against the Delta variant of the coronavirus. Abdallah is the first vaccine to late in American origin to receive authorization for emergency use from the Committee on New Molecules of the Federal Commission for Protection Against Health. Cuba received a new batch of medical supplies from China in the context of the fight against COVID-19. China has provided medical oxygen, respirators, protective gear, and other supplies for the prevention and control of the novel coronavirus. Authorities in Beijing noted that they will continue to supply medicines and food aid to the Caribbean nation to help it meet the needs of the population in the midst of the health emergency and in the face of the economic blockade imposed by the United States. This is the latest sign of solidarity and advancing bilateral relations between the two countries. Protesters gathered near the United Nations headquarters in New York this Monday to demand equal access to vaccines around the world. Ahead of the first day of the high-level general debate of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly, protesters stressed that unequal access to COVID-19 vaccines remains an urgent issue and that rich nations must share doses with poorer nations rather than administering booster shots. They also denounced that huge profits made from vaccines, many of which received public funding. The World Health Organization reports that almost 6 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered globally. But 75% of all doses have been administered only in 10 countries. I'm here with everyone else to call for President Biden to make good on his promises to actually enact a triple waiver to actually share the vaccine technology, including from the publicly funded NIH Moderna vaccine with other manufacturers and to invest in global manufacturing worldwide to so that we have enough vaccines for the rest of the world and to stop this apartheid and a pandemic. And personally, for me, I'm from India. I was born there. My family's there. I've had family and friends who have passed just because they didn't have access to a vaccine, even though it was available here. The rest of the world, because um, right now we're offering the booster shots, but they're forgetting about the other countries like Africa, Latin America, India. Those people over there are dying, children, elderly people of all ages are dying all over the world. In a pre-recorded virtual address to the United Nations, outgoing German German Chancellor Angela Merkel has noted that recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic offers the international community an opportunity to work to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The COVID-19 pandemic has settled back also with respect to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is therefore all the more important that we take resolute action now. This global crisis is also an opportunity to make our life and economies more sustainable. We want to use the recovery from the pandemic to achieve a transformation to genuine sustainability. It is clearer than ever before that we must implement the 2030 Agenda more swiftly. Germany intends to be climate neutral by 2045. In so doing, we are also sending an important signal for the climate conference in Glasgow. We will also apply ambitious targets at the Biodiversity Conference in October. Sustainability touches all areas of life and work. It is a task for society as a whole. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. 
Tunisian President Kai Zayed vowed on Monday to appoint a prime minister, but said emergency measures that he announced in July will remain in place. The president is facing ongoing calls from Western governments to restore the constitutional order. After he sacked the government, suspended parliament, removed lawmakers and also the immunity and put himself in charge of the prosecution back in July. I'm not here to showcase a place like the one you witnessed two days ago. Its director is known and is a failure, and its actors are some of the worst. These exceptional measures will continue. Transitional provisions have been made and the prime minister will be named, but on the basis of transitional rulings responding to the will of the people. Authority in the conflict torn Ethiopia have announced the country will not hold polls in at least 26 constituencies during the next round of national elections due to security issues. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's Prosperity Party secured a new five-year term in the first round of June by claiming 410 out of 436 contested seats in the federal parliament. A second round of voting is planned for September 30th. In the first round of elections, there were seven constituencies in the Romia region and around ten constituencies in the Harama region where elections did not take place. The board is inclined to decide to hold elections in the regions where there will be assistance without sabotaging the election process and the security situation will not be a problem. We have not decided how and when the election will be held in these places. However, since the number of constituencies is small, we will decide when to hold the election collectively all together. Thousands of students were hospitalized in the Kenyan capital Nairobi on Monday in the nighttime after a high school caught fire. Students with breathing complications were rushed to hospital after they tried to escape the fire in the Ofafa Jericho High School. Forty students were admitted and 15 were discharged after receiving medical attention. According to the school principal, no student was seriously hurt in the incident. The cause of the fire was not immediately known and members of the Nairobi County Department said investigations will commence at daybreak. The students were actually they developed problems of breathing because of inhaling that uh, smoke from that fire. So it was not physical injury but rather complications of breathing because of in inhaling that uh, smoke. And that happened in their effort to save the, that cubicle as they were actually drawing water and throwing it to the fire to, to put off the fire. Most of the students actually were taken to the hospital, they were attended to, and they were actually returned back to, 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 to school. The few are in the hospital, we have also talked to the hospitals, and they have assured us that they are in stable condition. Now we address other topics. Prime Minister of Denmark, Med Frederiksen, said in a United Nations private session on climate change that her country will contribute more than 1% of the $100 billion per year called from world powers and governments in the Paris Agreement to combat climate change. I recognize that we come from different starting points. It is easier for a country like the U.S. and for Denmark to reach the goals when it comes to the Paris Agreement and it's almost impossible for the poorest and most vulnerable countries unless the rest of the world, the richest countries, do more. So we need to, to use our aid more directly on climate change and we need to be more responsible. Um, and that's what I, I try to underline and uh, I also try to lead by example when Denmark can do it. Have, we have very high national ambitions and we are now dedicating more of our aid to, to, to um, climate changes than other countries can do the same. In Brazil, the water reserves of the hydroelectric plants in the south and southeast of the country have reached a historical low for the month of September.
Several plants register levels below those confirmed in 2001, when Sao Paulo State ran out of water. The largest hydroelectric plant in the southeast, Ilha Solteira, has reserves of just 1.45%, while another six plants are running on less than 10%. The Paraná River system has a month's worth of reserve water, but unless major rainfall occurs soon, there will be no way to generate electric power. Social movements have denounced that the Brazilian government cover up the emergency until September 7th, the date of major protests called by far-right President Jair Bolsonaro and financed by the agribusiness sector. Experts continue to warn of massive deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon, while the far-right government of Jair Bolsonaro continues to push its agenda into the interest of mining, logging and agribusinesses. According to the Deforestation Alert System of the Institute of People and the Environment of the Amazon, in August alone, over 1,600 square kilometers of forest were destroyed, representing the worst figure in the past decade. The figures for the last five months show that the measures adopted to supposedly combat deforestation have had little or no effect. Compared to August 2020, logging in the Brazilian region has increased by 7%. The 7,700 square kilometers of jungle cut down between January and August represent 48% more logging than in the same period in 2020. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm your host, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.